Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, does where you live affect how long you will live? New research has revealed that people living in the north of England are 20% more likely to die prematurely than those in the south. The study looked at five decades of death records to reveal a tale of two Englands with the north and south divided by resources and life expectancy. So what are the numbers? Well, the study led by the University of Manchester found that there were 1.2 million more premature deaths in the north from 1965 to 2015 and nearly 15,000 more in 2015 alone. There were a third more early deaths in the north among 25 to 34 year olds in 2015 and even bleaker for 35 to 44 year olds. There were nearly 50 percent more premature deaths in the north than the south in the same year. And if we pull out some of the average life expectancies, we can really see the difference. Women in the southwest, for example, likely to live to 83.9 years, whereas if you move to the top of the country and those living in the northeast are likely to have a life expectancy of over two years less at 81.7. For men in the southwest, a life expectancy of 80.2 years, and that again is two years more than those living in the northeast, 78 years. Primarily, it's uh, much higher levels of deprivation in the north um, that might be the drivers behind this, and we have the index of multiple deprivation, a detailed measure in England at the low geographical level that quantifies educational. Um, work-related uh, area deprivation in the sense that uh, about pollution or even accidents that might occur. Well, Sky's Becky Williams has been in Bath finding out if people there think that there really is a divide. And as you say, around a million more people over the last 50 years have died uh, younger up in the north of England. And it also shows this report that 20 per cent more likely to die under the age of 75. So a significant difference. And the authors of this report say it may well be uh, to do with social and economic factors. And uh, this, I should say, was a report compiled by Manchester University. Like I said, I've been speaking to a few people here in Bath. We're better to illustrate this story in the iconic southern city. Uh, let's chat to one person I found out who is a southerner but you've lived up north before. What do you make of the fact this report saying people die younger up north? It's quite surprising because the north are quite jolly people I find. I lived there. I lived in Leeds for a bit. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's darker days. I think the south we've got the beaches, we've got um, much more parks down the south. So I prefer the south, living down the south. Lovely place. And do you think there's a north-south divide still? Um, yes, definitely, yes. Well, I lived in Leeds for a few years and then worked in Harrogate. There definitely is a divide still, but they're much friendlier up there. I think the South are a bit more reserved. I would concur. Thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate your time. Uh, well, there we go. We heard from a Southern there. Earlier on, as I say, speaking to Northerners, many of them saying that they can understand uh, this research. They feel perhaps uh, people are healthier in the South. Another couple said that they do think there is a North-South divide. And I should say uh, the country, according to this report, is split around the Birmingham mark. So anything in the South, here in the Southwest, Southeast, and London uh, classes are down here. And anything above the Midlands, including the Midlands, uh, classes as the North. But pretty worrying findings. And of course, the authors of this report say it shows not just the tale of two cities, but the tale of two well, let's talk to a GP, Mark Spencer, from Lancashire in the northwest, one of the areas with the lowest male life expectancy. And many thanks indeed for joining us this afternoon, Mark. Uh, your reaction to this study that really highlights the division between the north of England and the south? Yeah, um, it's very sad, really, and, and I think completely unacceptable that such health inequalities still exist in the 21st century and I think Manchester need to be congratulated for for, for publicizing this uh, yet again um, but I don't think this is this is news certainly not to those of us that, that work in disadvantaged communities um, life expectancy in deprived areas has been significantly lower than affluent areas for for many 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 decades um, and I think the, the, the sad truth of the matter is that that gap is getting worse. Um, 
uh, and in fact life expectancy in our most deprived communities is now actually going down uh, and that that is completely unacceptable in the 21st century um, the, the report also highlights the importance for investment and more investment in, in the north of England to rebalance um, the inequality that currently exists. The government is saying, well, actually, it's not so simple as that. There are a lot of reasons why there is health inequality. Would you agree with that? It's a lot more complex than simply pumping money into the region. I, I, I would. It is a very complex issue. And, and I think... It's oversimplifying it to say that it's a north-south divide, um, that there are disadvantaged communities all over the United Kingdom, um, particularly in urban centres, in, in city centres, uh, and you'll find life expectancy in some parts of the southeast and the southwest, um, where those disadvantaged communities exist, is just as bad uh, as parts of the north and, and parts of Glasgow and, and so on and so forth. So I think just saying it, it, it's north-south is too simplistic, um, but it's certainly multifactorial, um, lower educational attainment, uh, lower chances uh, of, of well-paid employment. Um, and I, I, I think the biggest thing by far is people that live in disadvantaged communities re really lack hope. They, they lack hope that, that their life is ever going to be any better this, the situation that they're in. So really, why should they um, look after their health where, when getting through today is, is, is bad and tomorrow is not going to be any better? Um, so I, I think it's hope and despair that, that the real issues in, in deprived communities. Yeah, and on, on that point, I guess what a lot of people will find really alarming is that if you look at the figures for those people who are considered to be middle-aged, from the 90s, we've seen the number of deaths and uh, how early people are, are losing their lives going up. With all the advances that we've seen in science and technology, this is the 21st century, after yeah. all. It, it is. And I th the, the messages around how to stay healthy are, are well known by everybody. You know, don't, don't smoke. Um, a, a, attain a healthy weight, um, don't drink a, excessive amounts of alcohol, take regular exercise. The, the messages are there. Um, but in disadvantaged communities, um, people choose not to, to listen to those messages. Um, they, they have to get through the day as, uh, uh, as best they can. And particularly things like mental illness, uh, uh, depression, uh, have a major impact on people's physical health uh, as well as their mental health. Uh, and I think that the, the communities that, that we're talking about, they do require a considerable amount of investment going into them, um, but they also require a different approach to, to those healthy communities or those communities becoming more healthy. I think it's quite clear that traditional public health messages just don't work in, in those sorts of places. Uh, Mark, you, you mentioned mental health as, a, as an issue. It is something that the, Theresa May, uh, the government, has been uh, highlighting for, for, for some time now. We've seen a lot of campaigns in, uh, re, in recent weeks and uh, in recent months. Um, what other illnesses, yep. what other ailments would you say are quite common uh, for people in these deprived communities? Um, I think alcohol is a major issue. Uh, again, purely a means of trying to get through the day and, and trying to cope. People t tend to use alcohol as some sort of medication and, and then end up taking it in excess. Um, and I was talking to a, um, a patient very recent, recently who, who was drinking very excessively. Uh, and we were talking uh, about, you know, how this is going to affect him very seriously and, and how it could seriously shorten his life. Um, and, he, and he said to me, Doc, he said, I know you're trying to help me, but actually it's not the thought of dying that, that's stressing me out. It's the thought of living. It's the thought of living in the, the situation that I'm in. And, and I really don't care. I really don't care. And so, that's so sad in this day and age. So sad and, and incredibly bleak. So how long do you, say, do you think it will take to, uh, to address this imbalance, this health inequality that we're seeing in this country? I, th I think that's an impossible question at the moment, because if anything, the, the, the imbalances are getting worse. Um, there, there's a lot of focus, particularly within the NHS now, of trying to provide more care in, in communities that have lots of older residents. Uh, and that's absolutely fine. You know, older residents ne need, need that care. Um, 
but there, there's more care going into those communities that, than into the very deprived communities, which are much younger, but have significant more health problems. OK, Dr. Mark Spencer, we'll leave it there. Many thanks indeed for joining us this afternoon. Well, let's get the latest now from uh, our reporter, Fraser Maud, who's at the edge of it all uh, in Birmingham. Very good afternoon to you once again, Fraser. So a very bleak picture if you're living in the north of the country. That's right, yeah, here in the Midlands, the West Midlands, of course, Birmingham right at the heart of that. Well, if you ask anyone here where they're from, from the north or the south, they'd say they're from the Midlands, but there's no escaping it as far as these figures are concerned. They're from the north, unfortunately for them. And uh, these figures really are pretty shocking. 20% greater chance of dying before the age of 75 if you live in the north. And over the 50-year period that's been studied, that's over a million people, almost one and a quarter million people more have died before the age of 75 in the north than they have in the south. And when you look at the breakdown of figures, uh, the experts who've uh, compiled this research say that it's getting worse when we look at the situation with uh, certain age groups it's uh, it's particularly bad in the uh, 35 to 44 year olds in the north than in the south in 2015 49 percent more deaths uh, 29 percent more deaths amongst 25 to 34 year olds they say that that gap is widening and that shows that more investment needs to be made in the north of england they say that a sticking plaster might be education trying to educate people about diet and and uh, lifestyle choices in terms of their health and so on but really they say that there is uh, a much bigger improvement can be made in the north than in the south when dealing with these sort of conditions that, uh, that cause these deaths uh, and therefore that's where the money ought to be spent. They haven't gone into too much detail as to what's caused the deaths although they have said that certain issues, certain uh, uh, conditions are more prevalent in the north of England. There are more accidents in the north as well but what they say is it does show a clear, a distinct north-south divide. I've had a chat with a few people here in Birmingham to see what they think to the figures and uh, well, let's say opinions are varied. Well, I think life's a bit slower up there anyway, isn't it? Not as fast as down here. You're on edge running around and looking where you're going and everything, are you? Yeah, I'm not surprised that there's a difference, but I am surprised it's such a big one, 20%. And I'm also surprised that we're classed as the North. Well, the South tend to live better, don't they, than us? Sort of, I suppose they've got to more expect, more, get more in the wages and... Um, what does that do with it? <laughs> a, better, a better lifestyle, perhaps, in the south. Are you worried? No. <laughs> They are, I see, not worried at all. Safe, sitting on the fence here in the Midlands, or so they think. But uh, as I say, statistically, this is in the north of England, so people ought to be a little bit concerned. I mean, the authors of the report say that they haven't explored the reasons behind the deaths, but they noted that the most common causes of death amongst young adults include suicide, poisoning, traffic accidents and liver disease. Uh, the government, well, they've said uh, through a spokesman that the causes of health inequalities are highly complex, but we're taking action by addressing the root social causes, promoting health healthier lifestyles and improving the consistency of NHS services, etc. Now, uh, the authors say that they need to do more than try and improve the consistency. They need to pump much more money into healthcare and into healthcare provision up here in the north than they do in the south. Otherwise, they say that this gulf and this uh, inequality may well get bigger. Uh, Fraser, good to see you. Many thanks indeed. Well, let's talk to Tracy Babin, who is the Labour MP for Batley and Spen. She joins us now live from Yorkshire. Many thanks indeed uh, for joining us this afternoon, Tracy. So, uh, your reaction to what is a, a glaring division between the north of England and the south of England when it comes to health inequality? Well, it's deeply shocking, but to be honest, it's no surprise because we know that divide does exist and it's not just in health, it's in transport, in opportunity, culture, and um, certainly can't be allowed to carry on because it, there's something wrong when if you're a young boy in one of the richest boroughs of London, you'll give 8.6 years longer than a young boy in, in Batley and Spen or, or Blackpool. It's just not right and we've got to address it. And so how do we address it? What, what is the, the solution? Um, the report highlights the necessity for more investment in the north of England. Um, is that one way to solve this crisis or is that too simplistic to say? What the government is saying is that actually the issue of health inequality is extremely complex. Well, of course, it's very complex. And for decades, people have been trying to deal with this. But I think 
Brexit seems like a massive opportunity for us to try and look at this in a very bold way. And um, Philip Hammond has an opportunity in the autumn to also make some bold choices about where the money goes. And it can't be that uh, 1,900 pounds goes on infrastructure in London, where we only get, I think, is 300 pounds in the north. Uh, certainly, we need more transport opportunities. We need um, parity with health, parity with opportunities and jobs and investment. And certainly, uh, my constituents and and I know that the north is crying out for it. Um, we heard a lot about this whole idea of the Northern Powerhouse when, when George Osborne was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, in January, the Prime Minister announced £556 million of investment going into the north of England, very much supporting the idea, idea of, of the Northern Powerhouse. So it's not that uh, the current government has almost turned its back on the north of England, or is it? But the, certainly the Northern Powerhouse, the money coming in, in, into the region, how can we be reassured that we're going to get that when there's so much insecurity around transport at the moment? And certainly our bus network is powerless. We need more support in transport. We, we cannot um, have a, a local airport, say Leeds Bradford Airport, and we can't get there because the bus service is so poor. So whilst on the one hand it's very warm words talking about the North Powerhouse and, you know, it's, it's, it's very positive. However, it's got to be more than that. You know, we can't have a situation where all the decisions are taken in the South by Southerners for the North. We, we need more power. We need to own that decision-making process. Okay, Tracy Braben, uh, many thanks indeed. MP for Abatley and Spen. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. New research led by the University of Manchester shows that people in the north of England are more than 20% more likely to die before they reach 75 than people living in the south. Our health editor Hugh Pym is in Salford for us. Hugh, they're calling this uh, a tale of two Englands. That's correct, George. They're saying that differences in life expectancy have been well documented, but what hasn't been uncovered before is differences in the number of deaths amongst a broad swathe of the population. Now, one of their main findings is that there were 1.2 million more deaths in the north of England than the south of England since 1965 amongst the under 75s. But if you go to younger age groups, there are even starker differences. Uh, first of all, they look at the 35 to 44 year old age group and there were 49% more deaths in the north than the south of England in 2015, areas with broadly similar numbers of people. As for the 25 to 34 year old age group, there were 29% more deaths in the north in 2015 and in both cases the gap has widened considerably. Now the authors say they think there are deep set economic factors at work here, a lack of investment going back over many decades, a lack of opportunity, a cycle of despair in some communities causing mental health problems and alcoholism leading to real health uh, challenges. Now the government point of view is that there are very complex factors at work here with health inequalities and they are being addressed that economic growth, ministers say, is actually higher in areas of the north of England than in the UK as a whole. But today's study certainly uncovers a new aspect of the long-running debate on the north-south divide. Hugh, thank you very much. Now, we often talk about the north-south divide, usually illustrated by inequalities in infrastructure, services and resources. But geographic differences even impact on how long we live for. A new study has shown that people in the north of England are 20% more likely to die before they reach 75. The researchers behind the study blame profound and worsening structural inequalities. The solution, they say, lies in investment. A line on a map that's about more than just cultural differences, accents and traditions. An invisible divide that could even influence how long you actually live. For decades, people have been more likely to die early in the north. And even though overall deaths of people under 75 have dropped across the country since the 60s, every year more than 14,000 people still die younger in the north who might have lived longer in the south. Even more alarming is what the numbers say about 25 to 34 year olds. Despite deaths for that age group being relatively equal throughout the 60s, 70s and 80s, a huge gap opened up in the mid 90s with young adults now 30% more likely to die in the north than in the south. The findings have been described as a health emergency, a terrible consequence, some say, of the disparity of opportunity and hope between north and south. 
And joining me now from Salford is Professor Ian Buckton from the University of Manchester, the man behind the research, and from Liverpool is Labour's mental health champion, MP Luciana Berger, a former Shadow Health Minister for three years until 2016, and now a member of the Commons Health Select Committee. Um, good evening to you both. Let me start with you, uh, Professor Ian Buckton. The simple question to this horrible statistic is why? We divided the country into two halves. So the why needs to be looked at in terms of those regions of about 25 million population each. As you said earlier, there's a 20% higher risk of dying in the north early, that's under age 75, compared with those in the south. But when we broke this down into the younger age groups, we saw a, a new pattern that was opening up in the mid-90s. So for those aged 25 to 34, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, into the mid-90s, there was no difference between north and south. And then there was an increase in the north, while the south continued to decline. At middle age, there was a closing of the gap from the 60s through to the mid-90s to almost no difference by 1995. That has now widened to a gap that's higher, so more than 50% right. higher chance of dying in the north compared with the south of those aged... Uh, 35 to 44. Again, the pattern of why was that the north was left behind the south. There's been continued improvement in early death rates in the south of England over five decades. Okay. But it's stalled for 20 years in the north. Luciana Berger, I mean, you represent the constituency partly of Kensington, Liverpool. In Kensington, Liverpool, you're likely to live 13 years less long than in Kensington, London. That is an astonishing statistic. What do you think should be done about that? Well, it is an astonishing statistic, and frankly, in 2017, it's appalling and it's a burning injustice which cannot be allowed to persist. It's not just how long people live, but also how many years that they live healthily. The healthy life expectancy in my constituency, in that ward, but in particular, Kensington, Liverpool, is 10 years less than it is down south and there's very many reasons why it's happening and we have a government that talks a talk but doesn't walk the walk when it, it says that it's seeking to address that north-south divide. There is so much that needs to happen and we need additional investment to counter what's happened specifically since 2010 which is the gap getting wider. So are you saying that resources should be moved from the south to the north from you know to shut down hospitals in the south or GP clinics and move them up to the north because the resources are finite? Well we know we, we know that in the north, that from all the, uh, particularly if we look at the resources that are being made available within the health service in primary care, for example, that yes, there is less given to the north than there's given to the south. But it's not just about what happens within our NHS services. It's actually what happens in the funding and allocation resources that goes into our communities to keep people well. And in, here in Liverpool, we've lost over £350 million from our budget since 2010 to affect things within our communities right. like our youth services. We know if we invest in the first 1,001 days of a child's life that we can seriously and positively impact on their life chances and their life outcomes. And yet hundreds of children's centres have closed their doors. And we know that this issue is more pronounced here in the north than it is in the south. Professor Buckham, briefly, I mean, it's not just a question of a simple north-south divide. Within the north itself, there are enormous differences. You get a Harrogate in Yorkshire, it's one of the wealthiest communities in the country. You get a bits of Cheshire, again, one of the wealthiest communities in the country. So it's not quite as simple as the, the numbers initially made out. If you look at the 10th most deprived neighbourhoods in the country, there are three times more of those deprived neighbourhoods in the north of England compared with the south of England. It, it's easy to talk about all the negatives here. I think that there's a, the way you can look at this more positively is a set of opportunities. The opportunity to reach the improving public health that's seen in the south exists in the north. And the strongest determinants of public health are social and economic. So there exists an opportunity to invest pro rata in building strong cities mm. and towns, vibrant economies, good schools, all of the underpinning of public health in the north. And we could close that gap, but it requires consistent investment over right. a long period of time and the moral courage to do so. Luciana Berger, um, you blame the, the current government, I, but this started, under, this started under the Labour government, didn't it? This, this started in the late 90s and then accelerated under a Labour government. 
Well, actually, what the research shows is that between 1997 and 2010, under a Labour government, that gap started to close, where we seriously sought to address those health inequalities that we see across the country. I agree with what the professor just said, but what's really, really very important is in the last week alone, on news channels like yours, we've heard how the government have sought to turn off projects which have see, would see that economic injection, like the one that they said they were going to do for Crossrail for the North. They've said they're going to stop that. We've heard in the past week alone about the cuts to funding in the right. arts, which see a £700 million okay. disparity between arts and culture right. in the North compared to the South. And that's got something that got you can't it. just talk about it. The money has to be there too. Indeed it does. Got to leave it there. Uh, Luciana Berger, Ian Buckham, thanks very much indeed. We know that there's a north-south divide in England. That's literally been noted since the 11th century. We also know your chance of dying prematurely is significantly higher in the north than the south. But a paper published today raises some alarming questions about mortality and its connection to economic and social imbalances. It looks at data on five decades of death in a population of about 25 million people in the Midlands and north versus about 25 million people in London, the south and east. The good news is that premature deaths have plummeted north and south over the decades. We're better off. The bad news is that over the years, there's a persistently higher premature death rate in the north. And that is despite efforts to narrow the gap. And for those between mid-20s and mid-40s, prime age adults, something strange has happened. Since the mid-90s, the north-south gap in that group has jumped. Well, there's lots of data to digest. Helen Thomas has been in Stoke to see what's going on. Industrial decline, ailing city centres, a dwindling population. And in contrast, a region, or more specifically a capital, ever greedier in taking the nation's jobs and wealth. It wouldn't be a piece of TV about the north-south divide without some images of the north that suggest industrial decay or economic malaise. And chopping England into two contrasting halves is a little bit cliched and it's certainly crude. But a report today highlights a very particular issue. For decades, you've been more likely to die young if you live in the north. What's worrying is that over the past 15 years or so, that rather grim outlook has got worse, specifically if you're a young adult. There is some good news. The University of Manchester looked at the mortality rate, or deaths per 10,000 people under 75. It has fallen. But this graph shows the stubborn gap between the north and south of England. And if you look at specific age groups, you see a surprising trend. Among 25 to 34 year olds, the gap had virtually closed 20 years ago. Since then, it's grown considerably. The 35 to 44 age group is a similar story, but the gap is now even bigger. The question is why? We didn't want to draw too much attention to the dealing with the intermediate factors rather than the root causes, which are social and economic. But commonly, any great rise in death rates of people of that age are the so-called diseases of despair, alcohol-related, drug-related suicide, violent deaths. His prescription is to weight government investment towards the North, a type of positive discrimination to build the economy. Other research in this area, though, has suggested that extra financial support isn't as important as encouraging healthier lifestyles. To invest in risk factors alone is to ignore the underlying causes of early death, which are access to resources in general, to have a good living condition, to have more control over your own life so that you can make those healthy choices. So is it time to relaunch the Northern Powerhouse? Past efforts to rebalance the economy towards the North have largely failed, and measures specifically aimed at health have fared as badly. Targets set in 1997 to narrow health inequality between deprived and affluent areas weren't met by 2010, a report on why called progress exceptionally slow. Yeah. Staffordshire yeah. University's Centre for Health and Development is an unusual partnership with two local councils. The aim? 
a new approach to tackling health inequality. I think top-down investment is vital and we need it and clearly we need more of it. Um, however, I think we also need that bottom-up approach and we need to give people a voice in our communities actually to help direct that investment so that it goes to the right places. We need to be looking and asking questions about people's quality of work and their work life. This is our working age cohort, um, what it's like to be unemployed in this day and age, impact of things like welfare reform, housing policies, education. Alcohol-related death rates have risen since the mid-1990s. This consultant at Stoke University Hospital has seen that firsthand. We're seeing more people and the age of the people has got younger because people have started to drink at a younger age and I think we're also seeing far more women. There's more desperation, I think. And if people don't drink because they want to, they drink because it's a way out. This is a big picture study about a very broad, long-standing problem. And it's just not clear what might change quickly. Very targeted programmes around obesity or alcohol or in areas like mental health may help some people, but that risks missing the most difficult, the most entrenched divisions. Major structural changes to the economy may be the answer, but no one knows for sure, and it certainly isn't a quick fix. Helen Thomas reporting. Well, Sir Michael Marmont, the director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity. He's also responsible for drawing up the 2010 Marmot Review, which set out a six-point strategy for combating health inequality. Very good evening. Um, mm -hmm. Look, let's just go right back to the beginning here, because we're used to premature death rates falling over the decades. Well, why is that? I mean, that's very good news, obviously. I think generally it's falling because we're a richer society. Everything's better. Nutrition is better. Housing is better. Living conditions are better. Working conditions... Everything's improved. Right, so fewer general. accidents at work and all of that. Yeah, all of that. Right. One of the other things we haven't talked about yet, but is that this report tallies with some stuff you've said, which is that that has flattened off over the last five years, so it's not falling anymore. That's right. Our report was looking at older ages and said it had flattened. This is looking at premature mortality under age 75 and said it's flattened. And flattened in the north and the south. Yes, that, that affects everybody. It affects what could be everybody. driving that? Well, we speculated, we speculated that um, policies of austerity post-2010 right decrease in adult social care spending, right, right. decrease in NHS expenditure per person could play a role and we said it's urgent to investigate if indeed that is related to it. Okay, let's get to this north-south sure. issue because there's a long-standing gap. What is the sort of the best succinct, <laughs> succinct summary of, of, of what drives this gap because it's at all ages over the decades there has been a some percentage higher premature death in the north? Well, I think we have some insight into it because when we look at mortality according to where you are in the social hierarchy, what we found, find all over the country, that the lower you are in the social hierarchy defined by education or jobs or deprivation, the higher the mortality. But the disadvantage of being low is bigger in the north than in the south. So somebody in the middle of the hierarchy has higher mortality than somebody at the top, but the excess is bigger in the north than the south. Somebody at the bottom, the excess is even bigger okay. in the north. So wait, so if you're a poor person in the south, equally poor to some, someone else in the north, you'll live longer in the south as that poor person than the person in the north. You will, if you're a professional. I don't why, why would that be? Because we've just said that the deprivation is driving a lot of this. Because I think the six domains that I identified in my review are all worse in the north than they are in the south. We could look at child poverty, for example. Let's take the first one on early childhood. Child poverty is worse, worse in the north than the south. We've also talked about the importance of Sure Start Children's Centres. They're funded by local government. The decrease in funding to local government is bigger. The right. decrease is bigger in the north than the south. So Sure Start Children's Centres are closing it's, it's, in it's great a numbers. Complicated point. OK, but let's, let me ask you also then about this issue, which goes, only back, goes back to the 90s. It's not forever, which is these younger middle-aged adults, so this is 25 to 45, yeah. where you've seen a really big gap. I mean, the, the rates have in fact improved or, 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 or not got much worse, but 
much bigger gap. What's going on there? Well, let's go back 10 years earlier, because what we saw in the 1980s, that the difference, say, for 25 to 34-year-olds between the North and South was almost not there, but it was rising, mortality was rising, both in North and South, particularly in men, in young men. And that was suicide, alcohol, violent deaths, the kind of disempowerment that we saw just now on your clip. But then what happened? In the mid-90s, things improved in the South. Mortality started right. to decline, and they didn't in the North. And my speculation is that that disempowerment related to social and economic conditions persisted in the North when things were getting better so in you're, the in, South. So in a word, that, that, that issue around drink or the, 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 the death by despair is part of what's going on in that group? Yes. Yeah. OK. If you'll hang on there, uh, because joining us uh, from Leeds is Susie Brown, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Zest. It's an organisation offering support to people living in disadvantaged areas of Yorkshire. And in Brighton is Christopher Snowden, the Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And Susie, I wonder if I can just start, what, just explain what you do and what you find and how successful what you do is. OK, well, we've been working in disadvantaged areas of Leeds for 15 years now and we try and level the playing field, essentially. So there's great health inequality in disadvantaged areas. We offer a range of practical um, support and then more general support. As an example of the practical support, we work um, with Jamie Oliver's Ministry of Food. We have two projects which teach cooking skills and healthy eating and budgeting and shopping to people, offering them, you know, the chance to learn to cook from scratch and le lead a healthier lifestyle. Does it work, Susie? It does work. There is a very strong evidence base and it's been published to, to show that it does make a huge difference to health outcomes. Okay. And then more generally, um, f we offer people just general support and uh, we're trying to lift them up and give them a leg up, really, and, and inspire okay. them to, to lead a more fulfilling life. Let me ask, uh, let me just ask, uh, Christopher, because I know you have a critique of version area, version, certain bits of policy. It doesn't feel like policy has worked over the last 20 years in, in, in reducing these health disparities. What, what's going on there? Well, the health rates themselves have fallen very much over the last 15 years, certainly. I mean, I feel as if we're addressing a cold case, in a, in a sense. This isn't really news in the normal sense of the word. We're looking at a very specific... Um, portion of the population. We're looking at men under the age of 45 and we're looking at why death rates amongst those people rose in the mid to late 1990s. Now I don't know exactly why that is. The author of the study uh, says he's not sure what it is. We do know, as Michael Marmot's already said, what the main uh, causes of death are at that age. Unfortunately, the death rate is generally very low amongst um, people who are in their 20s and 30s anyway, but it's suicide, it's alcohol, it's drugs, and I think you're quite right to describe uh, these things as uh, deaths of despair uh, up to a point. But it's also very true to say that income and economic growth are the great prophylactics for this. And um, you see that the, the North has less money and it has higher death rates. And you see that over time, as societies generally uh, got more prosperous, the death rate has fallen. However, we've got this odd anomaly in the North of England in the 1990s, very specifically. I suspect that drug overdoses is still there. Um, sorry, so, significant sorry Christopher. And other things too. Sorry, the, the gap is still there. I mean, it's true that a lot of that gap emerged in the 90s, but the gap is still there, isn't it, in that group? And there was no gap in that group to speak of in the, in the 80s. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and there has been no recovery, if you like. I mean, the, the, the rates have fallen very much since uh, round about uh, 2003 or so. Um, but they haven't caught up. And it seems to me that whatever caused that spike in deaths in the 1990s is still having an effect. It would be useful to, uh, to know what it is. But uh, even this, the author's studies haven't pinpointed it. I don't think it's got anything to do, incidentally, um, with austerity. And it doesn't seem to have anything to do with uh, the slowdown even in economic growth. You've got to remember, in the mid to 1990s, when these deaths were spiking, the economy was in uh, one of these longest periods mm. of growth we've seen for a very long I mean, time. Susie, yeah. do you ever feel that... I mean, one of the things that the paper actually suggests is that public health measures have done their bit in Victorian times with sewers and vaccinations and the like. And now a lot of the health measures are individual issues, 
Now, the paper doesn't, doesn't believe we should just rely on individuals to look after themselves, but mm. do you ever feel that you're, you're just trying to basically tell people how to live their lives as individuals? It's not really a public health matter so much these days. Well, no, no, I don't think we are telling people how to live their lives. We very much work with people and we offer a range of groups and activities that are all aimed at lifting people's self-esteem, their confidence and giving them the tools to lift themselves out of perhaps a very bad place. If, if you walk around a deprived community, you will see a lack of infrastructure, perhaps a lack of care. There's a lack of good things in that community. And if you are either born in that into that community or you find yourself in that community it's really hard to imagine ever getting out again and yes there is all this uh, you know on television we see this life and young people in those communities think that's not for me you know I'm, I'm not somehow deserving of that um, and people really really do see themselves as never having the opportunity the hope they don't have the same okay. aspiration to, to lift themselves out so we're trying to help from the bottom right. up and help people up and out into a better situation Susie Christopher and Sir Michael thank you all very much thank you.